What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. We have a very special guest today, Robin Farman Farmian. Perfect. What's up? <laughs> Thanks for coming on to the show. Thanks so much for having me today. Really excited to chat. You are a speaker, an author, an investor. Uh, you are patient as CEO. Yep. Is your book from two years ago. Yes. Um, you're also working on some really cool um, healthcare revolution products as well. This is all really exciting. You're writing another book, so let's let's start unpacking all of this epicness. Um, maybe we start with the insanity of this healthcare revolution: AI and robotics, sensors, uh, at-home care instead of actually going into the hospital, digital revolution of therapeutics. Like, whoa. Yes. So we're seeing a massive shift right now happening, and it's really moving healthcare out of the clinic and the hospitals and into the patient's home virtually or even to your corner drugstore like CVS or Walgreens. There are a lot of different technologies that are really helping make that happen, most especially sensor technology and AI combined is helping create this class called point of care diagnostics. And what that means is a diagnostic device that comes to you versus you having to go to the doctor's office or the hospital or the ER. You can now have things like even 12 to 15 lead EKG monitoring shirts that are ICU quality Whoa. used in the ICU and can be used at home. We have things like uh, ear monitoring devices. They stick right on your ear, on your iPhone, and it's called CellScope, and it's about $99. So instead of at two in the morning going to the emergency room with your little kid because he has an earache, you just stick this in their ear. The AI will analyze it, and it will flag it. And if you need to see a physician, you can do so on demand via the app, right, in video form. Ooh. So really seeing this massive shift out of the clinic, out of the ER, out of the hospital, into the home. So now I can go to Walgreens or CVS and go and pick up this point of uh, care diagnostic? Point of care diagnostic. That's cool. Some of them are sold at drugstore chains like that. Some of them are available online. It depends on, on which one you're talking about. That one for the kids is so crucial. The kid's like, ah, oh, my ear, my ear. And it's like, okay, let's actually take a look quick. And then we look and then we can video chat with the doctor. Exactly. Um, sometimes you can save on cost because and time and... Not sometimes saving on costs. So a, I, I, a friend of mine actually went through this exact scenario recently and posted about it on Facebook. And uh, her little kid had an, an earache in the middle of the night. They went to one of the emergency rooms down the street from their house and it cost them $27,000. Just walking into an ER is a ridiculous amount of money. Expense, yeah. So for this $99 gadget yeah. right, that, that takes the place, you no longer have to bring a kicking and screaming kid somewhere at two in the morning, especially if you're, you know, imagine it's winter time and it's freezing out and they're already sick. I mean, just for one point of care diagnostic, let alone the other ones that are coming on the market. Things like stethoscopes or ultrasound machines that you can now have for $300 a month subscription model. Wait, what? I know, isn't that so cool? So what? Philips has one on the market that is $300 a month to rent. And oh, I rent their ultrasound machine? Yeah, it's a and subscription I keep it, model. keep it in like the office? No, it's just house? a little tiny ultrasound wand and it plugs into your iPhone. Again, using the, the smartphone as the brains. And that's why we're able to have things like point of care diagnostics so is because you've got that smartphone yeah. as the brains of it. So really you just need that hardware, the sensor component to go along with the brains. Whoa, okay, so now I'm getting this uh, ultrasound um, one from Philips and wait why is it 300 a month to rent that doesn't it's, that seem like so shouldn't you, because you want to buy it out maybe or like I don't know it seemed like that was but that that also is crazy for a lot of people that want to get frequent ultrasounds and certain um, for diagnostics well guess what 300 a month you can do them as many times as you want or maybe you are a remote clinic and you're renting this, right? Because you, you can't afford to have a large ultrasound machine, but your patient base can't travel five hours to the nearest hospital. We have parts of the United States that are actually that remote. And so we need to start thinking about those as well. Yeah. You mentioned another important one at the beginning. What was the other one that you mentioned? Uh, EKG monitoring. That so, was interesting. Yes, this one's really cool. This one's coming out of Israel, a company called Healthwatch. Electrocardiogram. Yes. And so and that's usually put around this area to measure your heart. You have uh, anywhere from 12 to 15 leads. You know, those leads are, you can see the wires, if you can imagine that, and all over 
and they're, they're put in a very specific way. I'm not a healthcare professional, so I would not be able to administer this, this mm -hmm. to you. But I could give you this shirt to put on. And the shirt, putting it on, putting on the shirt, it's a compression shirt. It's a compression shirt. Yes, so there's a bunch of other ones on the market. This one actually has FDA approval and is ICU quality, real-time data, which means you can discharge patients earlier out of the ICU, Whoa. and you can discharge them earlier out of the hospital in general, and catch things when they start to go down Hill, right? Outside of the ECU, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, I so it, yeah. as soon as we start to see the EKG is off, we call, you know, Mr. Jones and say, hey, we can see this, and and the patient themselves will also be able to see it, and the health as well as the healthcare professional, and then you can intervene early before they actually need to be hospitalized. Yeah. Again, saving money, saving time, Sa saving lives, saving lives. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Preventative healthcare. Yeah. Yes. Hel actually being healthy health. Uh, not sick care, not post. Well, disease. that's still sick care, but it's it's trying to uh, predict and, and make sure that you don't get sicker. Because at that point, if you have to have an ICU quality 12 to 15 lead EKG monitoring shirt on 24 hours a day, it's not because you are practicing health, most likely. It, it is because you are worried about a heart attack or some type of cardiac episode. So when you initially uh, titled the book Patient mm -hmm. as the CEO, it was because? Oh, so I am personally the CEO, not only of my entire healthcare team, but also of Robin Inc. And that's just the way I live my life. And so I, my personal backstory is that I've had 43 hospitalizations, six major surgeries, and three organs removed for misdiagnosis. I would have had a lot of those hospitalizations anyway, but I would have kept most likely the organs. <laughs> And so at the age of 26, I fired my healthcare team, took control of my healthcare, got a whole new set of doctors, nurses, chiropractors, whatever I needed on the team at the time, ended up getting diagnosed correctly, put on a medication called Remicade, which is a biologic, and I went into remission overnight. So that's why I named it the, you know, the CEO of your own healthcare team. It saved my life. Not only did it save my life, but it gave me back my life. And it looks like you were the only one to, that was interested in saving your life. Yeah. You have to take yeah. it. You want anything done right these days, you got to do it yourself. You're on to something, Robin. <laughs> Ron's, Ron brings up a good point. If for some reason the initial diagnostics about you were not in of the highest caliber and quality, you had to take things by your own reins and then drive them towards your own health. Right, and, and it's not that they weren't high quality, it's I was at some of the top hospital systems in the United States. It's that diagnostics are that hard. They just really are that hard. So they have high quality, but they're diagn misdiagnosing? Mm-hmm. Because especially because you were talk, we're talking, I have Crohn's disease. So anything to do with the GI system is incredibly difficult to yeah. diagnose. Yeah. So I don't look back, I mean, these were literally the top hospital systems on the East Coast. I don't look back and say, oh, they just weren't doing their job well. I look back and say the technology wasn't there. They did the best they could at the time with the, with the amount of information they had. And as the patient, it is my responsibility to make sure that I'm staying up on current events and I'm constantly going and seeing new people if I have problems and if I'm in pain or if I'm not able to, to live the life that I want, make sure that I go out there and I get that help I need. Yeah. I wonder what the next, so maybe we talk about this, what are these next stages of us taking our, uh, our health into our own hands? So well, I mean, first and foremost, make sure you are doing all the basic preventive medicine things. Are you going, are, do you, you, you're practicing good sleep hygiene, which means go to bed and wake up pretty much the same time, seven days a week, uh, making sure that you don't have disruptions in the night and it's a dark room and it's a certain temperature. But there are different things that you can do to make sure that your sleep quality is as good as it can be. And then, of course, going to things like exercise, making sure that you exercise every single day and do a, a relatively healthy diet. Um, don't, of course, skip the chocolate cake, but these basic things that you really need to make sure that you have as a foundation. And then once you, you can get those kinds of things in place, you can even take it up a notch, right? And start to metricize and measure everything that you have and, and make it even a competition with yourself and, and try to get to that next level of being extra healthy. So with all this data that's gonna be coming in from sensors and this point of, point of care at, um, at home, 
Um, we're going to have a lot of data with this and we're going to have to learn how to make it applicable to our lives um, and hopefully do things like prevent ourselves from getting sick, yep. um, stay healthy longer. Yep. Are there some other really important takeaways about like healthcare revolution that we should be aware and oh, it's for. an exciting time to be in healthcare and it's an exciting time to be alive and take advantage of all of these different technologies that are that are hitting the market. So in terms of really taking control of your own health, uh, there's a lot of digital stuff that you can do now as well. Mm -hmm. In the world of AI, it's not just these uh, point of care diagnostics, but you can do things like measure your brain health because none of us have a baseline on our brain health, which means we don't catch things like dementia and Alzheimer's in the very early stages when they're still treatable by pharmaceutical intervention. So if you just take a, a five to 10 minute quiz once a month or once a year, you can have a baseline on your brain health, just like you have a baseline on your heart rate and your blood pressure and then measure tiny little changes in your brain health to make sure that you can intervene at really early stages when it's still either preventable or extremely treatable. Yeah, yeah. Um, the market for um, digital therapy, um, the market for being able to analyze the biometrics and then have a digitization of that data and then make it relatable and then be able to take therapeutic kind of steps um, to maximize your own health. Seems like where it's gonna be at home, right there on the phone, different uh, wearables, seems like that's where we're going. Oh yeah. And the insurance companies are getting in on the game. So the major payers, companies like United and Humana, they have investment arms and they are investing in what's called essentially um, uh, d disease management software. And, and that is that. So managing something like diabetes. Diabetes is an incredibly expensive disease. It's on a major upswing. It affects a, quite a large percentage of the United States, relatively speaking. And so insurance companies are looking for those AI solutions that will really help predict uh, be, uh, predict before somebody gets too sick, right? Uh, in the world yep. of diabetes, that means potentially having an amputation, which is very expensive and, of course, horrible for the patient. It's going to be so much money saved. Yeah, yes. that'll be huge. Yes. And then if we can funnel that back into innovation, yeah. Yeah. Heck yes. Isn't uh, that amazing? Yeah. It, 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 it always makes me feel good to think about n not wasting money. Right. Yeah. Being able to maximize the dollar. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of wasted money due to ignorance right now. Um, but that's kind of also the human experiment as we go through the phases of ignorance to learn and then how can we decrease the amount of ignorance that we have so we can just maximize our potential. Well, you know, start putting a BCI chip in your head with, you know, the AI. Are you down AI for that? The brain-computer interface, are you down? Of course. But are, but are you down like... Are you like, like that's a question? Of course I am. I mean, I'm really down too, but I need more conversation around the ethics and the philosophy and the programming, the design, all that kind of stuff. We just need more more roundtables about BCIs first, and then I think we'll be more down. But a BCI doesn't necessarily need to be invasive. Yeah. Right? Uh, when you put on a VR headset, essentially that's a BCI. But it's even a brain then, computer interface. E even if you're reading. Um, neural signature, uh, and then that's great. But what about writing through electromagnetic stimulation and all that stuff? Yeah, so you can get you know transcranial stimulated and controlled in a sense. And so I think it's important to also be very you know skeptical about. Uh, you know, who's making it? Oh, we were just talking about this, weren't we? Yeah, having who's in control of that, this technology. Everything that we're working on in this programming is, yeah. uh, can all lead to very bad circumstances. I just want to say that. Yeah, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? So... How do we get rid of the garbage? <laughs> How are we going to take out the trash? <laughs> when are we going to take out the trash? And who are we to say who the trash is? <laughs> Yeah, well, right now, the mind control is way more limiting, limited. It's mostly mind controlled by manipulation of economies and politics, incumbencies, corruption yeah, that's, in that that's sense. that's what you know, from what you know. But, but that's like, that's what it, yeah, and I know nothing, but that's like, that 
branch of it is kind of like the, the key of control right now. But when the key of control is now transitioning to your fucking smartphone, the thing that everybody has in their pockets soon is gonna be a brain computer interface, the control changes to an actual 100% objective plug right into that person versus a, um, oh, well, yeah, when you walk out the door, your options are limited because there's not a, uh, we don't have fresh spinach where you live. You have to eat the burger and it's way cheaper and you're poor, so that's what you have to do versus um, having a direct implant. So anyway, rabbit hole of BCIs. Um, <laughs> So in my world, in healthcare, BCIs are fantastic for people like paraplegics, yes. stroke victims, Alzheimer's, dementia, anything that um, impacts the brain or the, the CNS, the central nervous system, right? So um, I'm really excited about that area. This might be a good time to talk about Mind Maze. Yes. Okay, so let's do it. Mind Maze is fantastic. That's a company based in Switzerland and here in the United States. They have uh, offices, headquarters here in San Francisco and it's doing uh, virtual reality for stroke and brain injury rehabilitation. Recently got FDA approval for the Mind Pro Go, which is the at-home unit that you can take home after a stroke. And they also have the FDA approval for the hospital-based or the clinic-based unit as well. And it's really cool technology. What happens is in the world of VR, pretend say your left arm is partially paralyzed from a stroke. And what happens typically is you go through physical therapy to try and get at least a limited amount of motion back and range of motion mm -hmm. and all of that. But what we do in VR is we take a mirror image of the right arm we layer it over the left arm and that means when you move your right arm in the world of virtual reality it looks like your left arm is moving and that is enough to trick the brain into creating new uh, new ways of being able to map it so that you can actually move it more it's amazing and there's a significant number of white papers that have come out of that particular company Heck yes, yeah. mind maze. Yeah, okay. and that's just their first that's verticals. One, yeah, that's one. Okay, so I map my right arm over my paralyzed left arm, and then I move that uh, right arm mm -hmm. in the virtual world, and then I'm actually moving my left arm in the physical world, and that's how I'm slowly rehabilitating myself. Yes. And I'm building new neural connections. Exactly. Pathways. Um, I can just visualize it in my head, all these like, yeah. can you imagine? Oh. How we're able to manipulate with the digital world, um, new neural growth yes. for, uh, for rehabilitating an arm. Wow. But I mean, That's VR, good. outside of Mind Maze, VR in healthcare is being used now in quite a, different, uh, quite a few different scenarios from uh, especially PTSD with military men. There are a lot of companies working on that. Correct. Uh, anxiety, depression, pain management, or even for uh, pain and anxiety for say a dental treatment. So if you have a little kid going in, needs a shot or needs some kind of dental treatment, putting them in, into VR is enough of a distraction that Shouldn't they don't even pay attention to the fact that they just had a shot. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, so, so immersed into the VR that the physical body getting worked on the teeth or the shot or whatever is, you know, is secondary. Exactly. Um, it's distraction. That's yeah. essentially what it is, a major distraction, but at a level that we haven't seen before as human beings. It's very rare that I think about distraction being good. And so it's nice to, to hear distraction being good in yes. a sense, in this sense. Yeah, um, VR, AR, um, robotics, uh, AI, sensor technology, digital health. Okay, so that's okay. That's huge. My maze, huge, awesome. Um, let's talk about the um, thought leader formula. Sure. Okay, so this is the next book. Yes. I am already writing my next book. It's called The Thought Leader Formula, and it's for executives and entrepreneurs to really help drive business goals and drive career goals. Because a lot of the time, especially in the world, uh, when, you're, when you're in some type of a corporation, whether it's a startup or a giant corporation, sometimes the people who do the most work get the least recognition and the least amount of promotions and salary increases because they're not noticed, right? And why are they not noticed? Oh yeah, because they're the ones with their head down doing all the work. So I'm teaching that kind of person, mm. not only that kind of, that kind of person, um, how to be a thought leader so that they can really increase their 
ability to impact things, but then also the future of marketing is really all about thought leadership. So people interact with people, not with brands not with companies. And so having the CEO of a corporation or, or actually any number of representatives inside of the corporation be thought leaders really helps pull the company up with them, right? And does a lot of the marketing for them. Okay, so then there's so many people that are at work on a daily basis that are hustling it out, doing really good work, and then there's not so much recognition. Um, and it's, it's really important to f get recognition for the work that we do so that we feel like we're valued and that we're um, providing right. meaning. And we actually, a lot of the times, like it more than money, right? If you, yeah. you could make a $100,000 salary, but if everyone's ignoring what you do or taking credit for your work, that's a, that's a big thing as well inside of the corporate world. Like what happens when somebody takes credit for your work, but there's so much higher profile that you can't fight against that. You can't be like, hey, wait, no, I'm the one who spent 600 hours on that report, not you. Uh, this helps supersede that, right? Because all of a sudden you are as high profile or higher profile and no one's gonna do that to you anymore. So what is, what are some of the principles then in the book that tell the person that has worked 600 hours on the report to step forward and to say like, hey, that's my work and like, like I and get recognition? What, what do you? What well, do you I'm not even telling them to say, you know, step forward and, and claim recognition or anything like that. I'm, I'm giving them a formula and a set of worksheets so I really take them through a process on how to become a thought leader and how to start building those audiences and, and where do you think about the ideas coming from so that that doesn't happen to them going forward, right? What are some of those? So yeah. first and foremost, thinking about thought leadership as a business, right? This isn't something that you're gonna throw some Facebook posts up and some Twitter posts and maybe some cute messages and, and expect any type of traction. This is really a business and looking at it just the way you would build a brand for a new business, build your brand and this is your personal brand mm -hmm. right and when you're thinking about it as a business then you need to think about what's the business model and that's first and foremost before you start really doing anything else think about what is my business model what where is the revenue going to come from because that in itself is going to help determine how you message things how you package things up and even what potentially idea that that you really turn into that first initial thought uh, thought leader vertical and we also have a session of uh, like ethics and philosophy or our own values and mission um, because go, whenever I hear like, you know, business plan or business formula, I'm always thinking like, did we sit down at the table and talk about the ethics of the technology or the philosophy around it and how we bring it to the world? And so, um, so, so the brand, so you're starting a personal brand, yep. knowing your essence, your values, all that stuff, and then um, going forth and getting a business, knowing where the money's going to come from. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll take you through how to kind of figure that out as well. I'll have a way for you to, to kind of list out your skill set and brainstorm different ways those skills turn into money. Because I ran a conference called Innovation for Jobs, really on the future of work, and I understand what's going on where technology is going to destroy jobs, but at the same time, it's also going to create jobs, yeah. right? So how do you stay relevant? It's no longer that 30-year job at a, at a large, you know, Fortune 500 company. That's not going to exist going forward. So you're going to start looking at your, at your life in increments, and what are those skill sets that you have now that you can monetize? What are skill sets that you want to develop over the next couple of years that you can monetize? And just thinking about that as a lifelong process. Mm-hmm. This is kind of future of work. Yes. Yeah, let's, let's unpack this because if the nine to five uh, for 30 years at the same company is dead and people are uh, starting to do you know, bits of their life, you know, I want to do one year of my life working on this creative aspect of this technology or that, whatever it ends up being. Um, what if location agnosticism is also true, like you don't need to actually go into a physical office, waste an hour commuting there and back, et cetera. Um, yeah, so thought leadership totally works with the future of work as well. Exactly, because basically you're just creating a brand for yourself and I call it putting your brain out there. So now that I've written a book and when my second one publishes, it's really easy to access what I know. So you, you understand how I think and, and the kinds of things that I know, so I'm much more employable. Whether that's as a consultant or a salaried employee, you know what you're getting, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And then if we can put all your accomplishments and um, rather than on like a LinkedIn profile, if we can maybe stamp it on an immutable decentralized ledger over time, that's also great. Hashtag blockchain. Uh, <laughs> I got to get that in there, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Did not expect blockchain to come up today. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's so many applications with biometrics yeah. and immutability that are so important. Um, can you give us this, this scoop? Because I thought this was really interesting. Um, how does thought leadership affect the Me Too movement? Oh, yes. So I, I've been in Silicon Valley now for a quite a long time. And of course, I've been sexually harassed. I've been bullied. I've been pushed down. I've been abused in the workplace. It's, it, you, it is, the stories you're hearing, it, it really is happening. So instead of trying to fight against that, I realized that early on, you can't fight against this gender bias. You can't fight against the sexual harassment very well. I mean, it's just very contagious. and and a very a huge amount of stress, and most of the time the woman isn't, isn't going to win. So instead, just make yourself a harder target. Right? And that's what thought leadership is going to do. And I remember there was a Business Insider article on, uh, that interviewed me, and I said, now I am in a tank and the men are on horseback. Mm -hmm. Right, because it really gives me that step up so that uh, seriously, since my book published in the very end of 2015, I have not been sexually harassed at all in the workplace. And before, it was constant. I mean, it was, it was constant. It was a very specific end to that. It, was, it happened the day it published. Crazy. So it is a massive protection. And it's coming at this problem from a, from a direction Powerful of strength and, and uh, power yeah, yeah. and owning it, right, versus the victimization. Right. And Correct. Yeah. You can always yeah. you can you can see it from either side. Totally. Right? Totally. I, I really think that um, um, female leadership is so powerful. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I, we loved being at Women in Technology International and doing interviews there. Um, we love just all of the powerful women in these different industries. And because we think that um, the future is very female, um, you know, here, look at that. Look at that video of you speaking, you know, you, your gesticulation, you know, the way you carry yourself. Yeah. Um, this is so important. These are really important traits. This part of thought leadership is just straight up courage and confidence. I actually have a chapter on that, how to gain that confidence and credibility to be able to do this. Yeah. And a lot of the confidence itself will come down to just knowing your stuff, and that's going to be hard work. The first talk I ever did, it was a 25-minute talk, I practiced 40 times, 4-0. Not only that, but I hired a speaker coach to record me, and she gave me the video, and then I watched and I listened to the video at least once a day for a month. Yeah. Right. I spent a huge amount of time preparing for that very first 25 minute keynote. Yeah. It went off without a hitch. I did not say um even one time. Yeah. Um, did not forget a word. Um, that's good that you make note of that. That's badass. You do yeah. it all the time, Alan. Um, uh, 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 yeah, I got to stop filling space with the word um. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> As you continue to do it. Yes, exactly. So, okay, thought leadership for the Me Too movement is very interesting, can be empowered through us, through leadership. And, um, and that way we can do things like take stages, give really powerful talks, write books, start companies, get funding for companies. Get higher salaries. Higher right, um, easier consulting jobs, anything you yeah. want. I mean, the, the more well known you are, and the more well known that your ideas are, the more hireable you are. <laughs> first, first, you get the money, then you get the power, then you get the women. That's so misogynist. You know, that's from Scarface. Nobody, you don't. Of course, you yeah, don't remember, yeah, you know. But I can do the exact same thing from the female's perspective. First, you get the money, then you get the power, then you get the men. Or Mitch, Mitch McConaughey, is he the big guy still? I don't know. Who's the, we can't talk about these things anymore. We, well, the, the beauty of it is like the heroine's journey at the same time as the hero's journey, right? The, these journeys that are going on. And whenever I see the heroine's journey, I think to myself, like, you know, what's going on in the heroine's journey? Like, what does it feel like for a woman? Because, you know, for women, there are different 
you know, they're tapped into energy in a different way that men, than men are at many times, in many ways. And so, um, you know, thinking about it like, holy cow, what does your low look like? What does it feel like? Um, what does your high look like? What does that feel like? Who do you go to when you're really low? How do you pull through the low? So hearing all these different aspects of the heroine's journey and um, having somebody be writing about thought leadership that's close to us, is, this is really important. Woohoo! Yeah, yeah, we're we're super grateful to have um, people that are inspiring other people to build a bright future sitting across from us. Like that's one of the things that we care about a lot on the show. And you're writing a book to do so um, at a big scale. So we hope to, you know, link in bio for um, Patient as CEO, and soon we'll add the link. When is it? Like six months? Is it? It, that? it will be out January, February, and I will be cool. launching an online program as well. Did you? Did you have any promotional material for this book that we could have been privy to? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Not soon. yet. Soon. Soon. Yes. Another couple of months. I'm still writing it. <laughs> Let's see. Let's ask you a couple of our um, simulation questions. Um, the first, I mean, the first question, we, we talk about this a decent amount on the show, but I think this is really applicable to especially you. But what is the future of the decentralization of data as well? Um, in, in general, healthcare? And also general data and privacy for, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about both healthcare, so, but also in, for all applications. I mean, it's really early to think about in healthcare. There are a couple of big things going on that are trials, like Walmart dipping their toe into to blockchain slightly and things like that. What it's going to be best for is, of course, things like the billing and um, and the EMRs. So our EMRs right now electronic are electronic medical records. Yeah, electronic medical records. Now most clinics are are on electronic medical records, but the problem is is the interoperability and different systems don't yes. work with different systems. Think about like Microsoft versus Apple, but we've got like 10 major players in the world of healthcare that are Apple's and Microsoft's all using different platforms. You and then, can't take the clinical record from where you just were and apply it to the next clinic. That not, you easily. Go to. Yeah, not easily, not easily. So yeah. it's the transfer of these EMRs and not only uh, with uh, outside of the hospital, but within the same hospital system. Sometimes the like emergency room EMR doesn't work with, say, the OBGYN clinic's EMR in the same hospital system. So this is a major problem. So that is one of the things that might be able to provide some type of a solution. Um, but you do have to worry about things like the HIPAA stuff, right? Access so, control to the data. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the access control to the data, but it's getting the data there. Right, so even if you've got the most secure, you know, decentralized blockchain platform that you could possibly have, you still have to get the data there. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, and in that and prevent journey, um, people from tapping into Right, the, because yeah, we have yeah. very strict laws around yeah. health and privacy with HIPAA laws, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. Um, we kind of tapped into this a little bit when we were talking about um, BCI's brain computer interfaces, but um, what do you think is the um, exponential technology that's going to augment the human race the most? AI. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And where do you see the most profound augmentations with AI for the human race? Well, it's just the ability to, let me give you an example. 3Scan, it's an early stage startup company. It can do in one day, using machine learning and um, some special cameras and stuff that they do use, uh, that it would take a traditional pathologist one year. So really accelerating Wait, human what, learning. What are, yeah, that's huge. What are they, what's the pathologist usually takes a year to find, what are they, what, are they, what disease are they finding? Oh, I, I mean, this is, it's complicated, right? So like pathologists, they could be looking at any any amount of things from from the human body, right? So the point is, is that what an, uh, one year's worth of the pathologist time equals Take one day, day worth on in this AI. particular yeah. company called 3Scan. So that's that's already in existence. So like that's that kind of the delta that you need that's to think huge. about there. 364 days yeah. of time saved, and also more effect, more efficient at reading and scanning. And right. It doesn't so it's need to sleep. Yeah. That much more progress with diseases in general. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you continue kind of linking back the, um, the most profound thing about AI is kind of a savior of time. Savior of time. Um, it's fantastic at pattern analysis. Yeah. So anything to do with uh, diagnostics when you're talking about imaging 
right? Radiology, uh, it's fantastic decision support software for radiology yep. because it, that's all that's doing is it's analyzing images yeah. and that's just data. Uh, so the big problem with, it, one of the problems with AI is that it just needs that much data. We, we do have it coming out, but I think the, uh, the general expression is that life begins at a billion data points. So you can't just start to you know, wire up maybe four yeah, people yeah. and get enough. Um, okay, here's a, here's a question. What advancements are happening in the United States um, that are not, that are happening maybe even better in Europe or in China, where, in these other places in the world? Do they have healthcare advancements that are going on um, or even advancements in AI that you're aware of that are um, outpacing the U.S. in ways? Well, um, Japan is much better than we are in a lot of the robotics, right? Um, and like they've which, got like, do you know which ones? They've got Pepper, yeah, right, and and companies like that. So Pepper is really one of the first SoftBank Robotics. Yes, exactly, and and he's awesome. But what we're gonna what we're gonna see is for everyone who doesn't know what Pepper is, this is. It's about four feet tall and, and it's a robot, but it's just essentially a companion. Uh, its little arms can't actually lift anything. It's not gonna bring you anything. It can dance and amuse you. So essentially it's a companion. Companion, yeah. Yes, and this is being used as concierges or in hospitals or grocery stores. So as a customer service representative type role, but you can also of course have them in the home. Now, that being one of the first, over the next two or three years, we're going to see a massive explosion in home robots. And they aren't necessarily going to look like a humanoid robot, like, uh, like a pepper type thing. Some of them are just looking like Amazon Alexa. So really, Amazon Alexa and Google Home, these are personal robots in the home, right? Yeah. So we're going to see a lot more. Yeah, there's Pepper. Thanks, Ron. Isn't That's he a good adorable? Very adorable, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, so this is a companion robot. So mm -hmm. again, this is things like me talking to the Google Assistant or to Siri or to um, Amazon Alexa and me asking the questions, maybe um, asking um, for, I get some emotion here. I get to see some facial expression. Yes. And I get to see some hand movement, some dancing. So dancing, little... some bright colors. Uh, so the really cool thing about a lot of these, not just Pepper in particular, is that they are platforms. So that means other companies can build apps on it as skill sets. So equip, yep. you know, artificial narrow intelligence, right, A&I. And, I. and um, these also learn. So the more you interact with them, the more personalized it gets to your particular personality and your likes and dislikes. Oh, I can hear some stress in your voice. I'll play some calming music. Exactly, yeah. exactly, right? And it's uh. gonna anticipate your needs. Mm. There's one coming out on the market later on this year from, uh, from Asia called Rocky Robots. And it's adorable little robot. Um, like, I think he's about from here up. And it's specifically for millennials. And what they like and what they love to do and all of that. Do you know what it's going to do? So uh, it's going to interact like Amazon Alexa. It's going to interact with Yes, but this Rocky is very robotics specific. Robotics yep, Rocky to Robots. To millennials. Yes, there's another one coming out of Israel very specific for elder care. So they're targeting their little robot and it doesn't even look like a robot, it looks more, it doesn't even look like Amazon Alexa, but more like an object type thing um, with an ability to have video so that for elder care you can interact mm -hmm. with your family, interact with your healthcare professionals or whatever, you, whatever you're doing. And there is one for childhood that's um, coming out next yep. year, I know. Um, we're going to have them on the show when they're ready. Um, iPal should be on the market soon. Um, if they're not already, I thought they should be on the market. But iPal is, looks like Pepper, yep. and, uh, but smaller. And it's specific for both uh, dementia but also childcare because it is that smaller robot. Yep. If you ever went through the San Jose airport, you saw some of iPal's. Um, they, they sometimes have iPal in the airport just as a demonstration unit. You so live in Palo Alto. I know. You reference the San Jose airport instead of the San Francisco airport. <laughs> they're so close to each other. They're only like 40 miles away, the airports, and Palo Alto, San Francisco, only 40 miles away. Yeah. But it can be like a world of difference when it's a two-hour drive in traffic to Palo Alto. I forgot that I was in San Francisco for a moment because I'm so used to being in Palo Alto. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, there's the iPal. So, okay, so the, the, the age of robots that are, are, are companions and senses and also have the vast 
a myriad of, of data about not only us, but also on all of the internet that um, they can tap into for mm -hmm. information for us, for helping us out, helping us live better, saving us time, all that good stuff. Okay, let's talk about this quick because I do still want to learn about it. Um, Act Avalon. Act Avalon. Yep. Yes. So teach us about curing cancer with the P53 protein. Yes. So yep. we are an early stage small molecule oncology company uh, working both with the pathway P53 and AHR. Uh, AHR may also be a big deal in the world of autoimmune disease, but the big deal with P53 and the pharmas have spent billions of dollars trying to crack this code is that when you get cancer and 50% of the time about, what happens is it infiltrates the cell and P53 finds it and, and realizes that cancer has come knocking on the door and it kills the cell. But in 50% of cancer cases, P53 is damaged. And so imagine, and it doesn't look anything like this, but if you are a complete layperson, not a biologist, think about a walnut. And the walnut shell is the P53. And when that's cracked, then the cancer can take over the cell or the walnut. And, um, and once it does that, it can replicate. And replicate and replicate and that's what so happens with cancer. So P53 protein acts as a defense mechanism in the yes, cell? Yes, what happens is it's what kills the human cell when it detects cancer and when that is damaged it can no longer kill the human cell which allows the cancer to spread. If you go in there and repair the damaged P53 it can then do its job of killing the cells whenever it detects cancer and we should be able to treat or cure potentially 50% of all cancer. And is this uh, an immunotherapy then? Uh, it's, it's a small molecule, oncology So the, oh, it's a small molecule and yeah. then it just powers up my P53 protein into my cells? It just powers it to Well, now you get into combat? like the, the deep, deep science. More biology. And so that, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's no way to explain it in the layman's terms that, that even I couldn't impart to you guys. But okay, cool, yeah, just cool. imagine some cool small molecules going in there and repairing P53. Okay. What are you saying? We're not that smart? No, I'm saying Come on, I give us a go. think it's just you that's not that smart. <laughs> He's definitely a genius and brilliant. Uh, I'm smart. Not, not what smart. everybody says, like, dumb. I'm smart. And I want respect. I want respect. <laughs> See, you're the good-looking one with the, you know, funny accents. That was Fredo from The Godfather. You didn't? No? I'm dating myself on that one with my disco shoes. Nice. I'm glad well. Ron got called good-looking. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're not bad looking yourself, Robin. We can't say that anymore, though, either. Those days are over. Sorry. Let's get back to the show, please. Come on. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I don't, I don't, think, think, those, I don't think those days are, are over. We can slap friendly. We can slap friendly like, hey, you look pretty good. And then it's a 15-minute timer. Whoa. Um, Yes. I did not expect that. It was almost like I was in the middle of Star Wars with some kind of lightsaber. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and then the 15-minute glass comes out. We're not, we're, not, we're not done with it. People can still say, you're looking good. Yeah, you're looking good, too. Like, we can still, we can still get there. We will. We'll keep, we'll keep doing that, you know. Okay. Um, okay, a couple questions on the way out. So um, what do you think is going on? Exponential technology is continuing to exacerbate wealth inequality in many ways, but the bottom is still like slowly coming up in terms of SES, but the top is just exploding. What do you think is going to happen with wealth inequality? That will probably continue. Uh, we'll, we'll start, we'll see a lot more of uh, people getting yeah, a lot more people who are much wealthier, right? So almost no middle class and squeezing out the middle class and just having the lower and the upper classes, right? Ron, you want to throw the quote in? Yeah, if it's the end of the middle class, pick a side, people. Pick a side. That's all you can do. I'm glad you, you come to terms with that, Robin. And you understand that. You see that. You know it's oh, not going to... Yeah. yeah, Alan's got this utopian Logan's Run world where we all live forever and everybody's dancing around the maypole, loving each other, He's hugging each other. He's younger than we are, so he is going to live longer. <sighs> and if we can get it to the point where we can, you know, be immortal, you might with your generation. Yeah, it might um, happen. But so, ch so check this out, though. Uh, although you two are correct that the wealth inequality is being exacerbated to a point where it's looking like it could be the end of a middle class, you got to pick a side, either you're going to be poor, you're going to be rich, etc. Um, that 
it might not be just the straight up with brain computer interfaces and all these retraining methods there might be actually pretty easy to take people that have uh, maybe um, lower IQs or people that have um, just a less of a drive to want to do anything every day um, and help them um, become more motivated and more intelligent to, to uh, make change but of course uh, yeah like uh, artificial intelligence is just so much more intelligent than even the smartest people on the bell curve. So then what the, um, what the F is gonna happen um, when humans are rendered you know, completely useless? Um, hopefully not, but... Uh, I don't think that they're ever gonna be com completely useless. We still need that human connection. We're still animals that, that go in herds like that. So unless the AI is really indistinguishable. But if the preservation of life is the ultimate goal, even past the death of our star and the death of this solar system, then just preserving consciousness digitally and sending that off to colonize other parts of the galaxy for now um, is a good idea. And so, you know, we'll see. Anyway, it, it, we got very uh, uh, sci-fi quick, but... I it, think he got very sci-fi. Yeah, 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 hey, 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 uh, but you actually mentioned the end of the middle class. Now, do, now what do you see uh, happening, though, with that? Well, if you end? think about it right now, even the people who are, especially in the United States, in the most poverty-stricken, they're still living considerably better than they did 100 years ago, right? Someone who was in poverty at the same level, say, if you were looking at it as a percentage, um, they were living so much worse 100 totally. years ago. So in 50 years, maybe the people who are at the far end of the poverty spectrum are living maybe as well as, say, someone who is just regular poor now. Right now, exactly. Right? And so maybe totally. we can make sure with, with this abundance that technology can help yeah. give us. Maybe Eradicate we can, suffering. Yeah, so yeah. these dire, the people who are in dire straits, maybe we can get them shelter and safety and yes. food and yes, get yes. Those, those baseline needs met, right. yeah. which never before has been possible in, in human history. Yeah. Gosh, like Amazon's building houses for like 5,000 bucks a house. It's going to drop in price dramatically. We're already soon, seeing yeah. the 3D printing houses, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's just going to get better and better and better. Yeah cost of housing is going to drop. I mean, yeah. the cost of making the housing structure, not the cost of land. Cost of land is still, yeah, you know. Yeah, <laughs> interestingly enough, that's why, that's why a lot of people live right here on Market Street because um, they're centrally located. You can't put a $5,000 house in the middle of the street, but you can just lay there with a sleeping bag um, and wake up the next day and be centrally located again. Um, and so who knows if, uh, if there will be a movement to try and, you know, move people off the street. Um, you know, hopefully, um, what if they don't want to? There's so many, there's so many things that go into play there. Well, but, they have a clear conscience too, you know, they don't play the game, conscience. they live in the street, they, you know, they're yeah. not doing right or wrong, they're just, they're just not participating, they're still alive. You know, it could be a rigged game, you know, that they just don't want to play. They don't I, want to play the rigged game, yeah. Yeah. Robin, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Oh, I don't know. Just ability to be alive is amazing. So maybe that's it. Just the life itself. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is consciousness coming through your physical form or is it localized here physically? Um. So I have synesthesia. And oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, sweet. I love synesthesia. I get it every once in a while yeah. as well. Yeah, every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, it turns on and off. I don't have control over it. Um, so I actually can see sometimes people outside of themselves. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And, um, Wait, what does that like look radiating. like? radiating. Uh, what does that so look like? So there was, this was so crazy. Um, there's a filmmaker out there named Tiffany, and she, was, she made a film. and What's she Tiffany's talked, last name? Shlaine. Yeah, it's Jordan Shlaine's uh, sister. Yes. We had Jordan on the show. Just oh, like so yeah. Tiffany, I, I didn't, I we didn't saw her movie when she just had first released it, I mean, years ago, five, six years ago at least. And she talked about her synesthesia a little bit in the movie and how she sees Jordan as green. Yeah, and wow. I was like, because I see him as green. Uh, oh, Jordan? that's crazy. I, yeah, it was crazy. And so when after the movie, because it was like a special screening for friends type of thing, I went up to her and I was like, I, he's that color for me too. 
And, and she was just like, yeah, it was just mind blowing. Because you had never talked about him being green. I never yeah. talked about that with anybody. anybody. And I didn't know Tiffany that well. I just That's met her a couple weird. of times at that point. And I had no idea that she had synesthesia. Because there's all these different colors that he could be too. Yeah. And so the, I wonder if He's that has to do with He's a very specific green. Yeah, if, if, I wonder if that has to do with his essence, his soul maybe, that yeah, you both that see I'm him seeing. that way. Well, that you both do maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and I can actually sense pure evil as well. And I've have met it previously. What the hell? And so I, I, uh, I used to. Well, say, what are you looking at me for? <laughs> what are you looking at me for? He's not. He's not. <laughs> no, he's, he's not. Yeah, I know. So he's a I, cutie. I used to speak Farsi, Softy, and um, I was with a friend of mine who happened to be a pathologist. I don't know why I've said that word so many times today, but uh, random. And we were walking down the street and we saw one of his academic partners who was also a pathologist. And he came up and he started talking and. My, my brain went completely dead. And I could not think of a word in English or Farsi, and he was, uh, and he was Persian. Farsi. That's why. Yeah, Farsi. Farsi. Persian. Um, yeah, yeah. That's what I speak with my new boys in Fremont there. Yeah, there that's what I speak with my Afghani friends. Oh, my yeah, God. they speak it in Afghanistan as well. Right. And my brain just went dead. Sorry. And I couldn't think or move or talk or anything. I was just kind of like this. And when he walked away, I looked at my pathologist, uh, physician friend, and I, I'm like, he's, he's pure evil, right? And, and he's like, oh, yeah, that guy is probably the most evil man I've ever met. And my friend had known him for a year at that point. And I was like, I could sense, sense it, it so much that it shut me, shut, shut, shut me down completely. What was his behavior like? Though? Nothing. Nothing. It was just like, hi, my name is Fred. It's a nice day out. How are you? you I, I work with your friend. Evil. Wow, this is crazy. Okay. All right, yeah. so... Um, that was the only time I've sensed it at that level. Like, I, you know, there's a lot of people who are... Very maybe, acute to You know, narcissistic well. or mean or a mm. little bit evil or something. This totally. was someone who was on the far end of the spectrum that I didn't think existed. Whoa. That is crazy. I don't know if I've met someone like that before. I, I ran. Like, I, I could not get away from there fast enough. And I, I'm, I'm telling you, he did nothing wrong. It was just like, hi, my name is... And I don't even remember his name at this point. Hi, my name is Fred. You could hear the music. Okay. Um, a couple, couple more questions on the way out. Um, do you think we're alone in the cosmos? No, of course not. Come on. What, what does life outside of this life look like to you? We can't even imagine it. So right now, think about trying to imagine another sense. Mm -hmm. Sense of smell, sense of taste, sense of touch. Can you imagine another sense? No. Because we just, uh, we are Tapping our into like electromagnetic like feeling? No, I mean like something that no one's ever talked about before. Right? You just can't. You can't imagine oh, you mean a sense an unknown, like hearing. Unknown, unknown. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's no way to really imagine what other things might exist out there that have completely different shapes mm. or senses, mm. or if it's even in other dimensions, or if there's multiple dimensions going yes, on. Yes, multidimensionality. Yeah, there, I would say my mind is open to all of those possibilities. Us too. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, do you think there's a designer to the universe, a creator? There's something out there, but I don't know if it's a single entity. A simulator to the universe? It could be. You know, there might be something that's godlike that exists. Do you think you live exists. in the base reality, or do you think you live in the simulation? I don't know, because, I, I, yeah, I, I kind of actually think that sometimes. I wonder if I, if, I live in the, uh, if I live in a simulation or if it's, this is IRL. You know? Yeah. Is this in real life or is this a simulation? Because when you look at stuff like this, you know, Look at the delay on that. Move your hand again. Look at that. You know. Yeah. So it's just it's just uh. There's like, there's me is, in the simulation. That's right? you in a simulation. So how is this not one? Right. Yeah. 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 Awesome. What a great conversation, Robin. Thank you for joining sure. us on the show. We greatly appreciate it. Thank <laughs> Thanks you. so much for having me. Yes. And we have um, Patient SEO link in the bio. Check it out. Um, also, um, definitely check out a lot of the other uh, content that we talked about today. So um, go take a look at that. Um, also, get ready for more Thought Leader Formula that will be coming out in about six months. Um, go and practice some of these things that you learned today. So take two things that you learned. Go share them with two people. Have them go share it with two people. And let's go start getting more of this thought-provoking conversation going on in the world. So give us a subscribe, comment below with your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. Also, join us on Patreon. Help us continue sustaining and supporting and growing this. We'd love for you to join us. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks, Ron, our producing partner. Much love. Peace.